I'm the product owner and project manager of Susan Manager. And here we have Julio, our fantastic reason engineer, and Jan. So, Julio, please. Okay, so once more, welcome everyone to the Uni Community Hours. We have something big in terms of changes for Uni this time. Well, but maybe it will not take me long to explain, so I will leave more time for Jan. So today we are going to present what's new on Uni 2021-06, and Jan is going to talk about what's coming next for the live patching filter templates. Starting with 2021-06, well, I guess that you are already aware that this version is the first one that is going to support and require OpenSUSE Leap 15.3 as base OS for the server and for the proxy, which means that this comes with SOL 3000. Remember that we are jumping from, sorry, say this comes with SOL 3002. We are jumping from SOL 3000. So if you want to review all the release notes for SOL, you need to check the release notes for 3001 and 3002. It also comes with PostgreSQL 13, with uh, new functionality, with uh, new improvements when it comes to performance. But there is something you need to be aware that is specified at the release notes which is that with this update, a reindexing of all indexes is required and that can take some time. So keep it in mind when, keep it in mind when you migrate, when you are running the, the bash script that is going to migrate your database from PostgreSQL 12 to PostgreSQL 13, depending on your current server, on how many channels we have, how many clients you have, and of course the hardware resources, that can take from just a few minutes to a few hours. So, well, as Donald told in a, on an email, maybe you want to use a Scream or something that ensures that if the connection between you and the server is failing, nothing, will, nothing bad will happen. And besides that, but this is just more for your information than because it's going to cause anything that you will notice, we are grabbing more dependencies from Leap itself that we, we, we are not going to maintain at uh, UNI itself, which is something good. And we intend to do the same for the next uh, versions. So other than the change of the base operating system, base operating system on all the services, we also added some missing OpenSUSE Leap 15.3 channels to a space one com space one common channels. And to be clear about this, the basic channels were already present, but if you updated your leap 15.3 lately, you will notice that now you have two new, two new repositories. One is called backports and the other one is called SLE updates. So now those are added to space one common channels. You can add them to your server, sync them, and then assign them to the clients. Finally, we have the integration of Ansible as well as a tech preview. If you want all the details, remember that Pablo presented this, I think during the last community hours, last month, if I don't, re if I recall correctly. Yeah, it was a month ago, exactly. And of course you have more details on the release notes and on the documentation. Now, regarding the clients and the sold version, we don't have SOL 3002 in all the clients. And the reason is that basically at this moment we cannot because SOL 3002 now is only compatible with Python 3. So you, you require Python 3 installed in your instance by default, which means that we have 3000, 3002 on CentOS 8 and clones, Alma Linux 8, Res 8, Rehel 8, well, <laughs> Rehel, it's, CentOS 8 is a clone of Rehel, Oracle, et cetera, et cetera. SLE and OpenSUSE Leap 15, Ubuntu 18.04 and 20.04. If you are going to ask if Ubuntu 16.04 is going to work, yes, so far it will still work, but it's going to have 3,000. 3, Remember, it's end of life. And Debian 10. The rest of the supported clients will remain with 3,000, meaning CentOS 8 and all the clones, Amazon Linux, Alibaba Linux, 
and sleep well. And if you are going to ask about what happens with CentOS, CentOS 6 and Rehel 6, those are not supported anymore. They are deprecated. They will still work, but they are going to use the same version they used in the past, 2016. And basically, those are all the news. So it's time for questions, if you have any. If not, then we can jump to Jan's presentation. Um, just one note, because we're migrating to a new version of PostgreSQL, backing up the current database is <clears throat> built into the migration script, but you can back up the database separately to a directory of your choosing and run the script with the space fast option that skips the backup portion. But if you if you uh, if you just let it run, you're going to have to have enough space where the database resides to make another copy of it again. So if your space for varlib pgsql is more than 50% utilized, you're not going to be able to run it. Yes, that's right. And speaking our, about backups, well, it's on the release notes and on the documentation, of course, but remember that it is highly recommended that you just backup the whole instance if you are able to do it. For example, if you are using virtual machines, then you can take a snapshot. So far, what I can tell you is that in all the migration tests that I did, if you followed the procedure, I didn't notice any issues. So it should be safe, it should work fine, but yeah, just take a backup just in case. Okay, if there are no, no more questions or comments, then I will start. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Sorry, just a quick question. Um, this is regarding the support of the DNF modules uh, in, uh, in Uyuni. Um, so uh, there were some uh, kind of discussions uh, the uh, past few weeks regarding this. Um, it is something finally which uh, which will be implemented. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the the best will be to have the uh, channels repositories with uh, DNF modules uh, to behave uh, exactly the same as uh, usual repositories. So, is it possible to do uh, such a thing? Is it something that will be supported or is it already supported perhaps with this last version or something you, you mean on like on the ui on the web ui uh yes yes exactly uh, i mean right now uh we you you have to uh deal with uh content life management to add some filters uh to to be able to to deal with uh, dnf modules so not really um, not really so the thing is there's two modes of operation one is the one that you're describing where you are using content life cycle management to flatten those upstreams to mm -hmm. plain repositories like they, they were in uh, rail 7 let's say okay that's one mode of operation where you uh, take uh, upstreams as the input and then create a flat repository the other way that you can work with dnf modules with federal modularity is you can assign you can mirror the uh, module report the modular repositories you can assign them directly to channels to so to, to systems and then uh, you manage those upstreams on the client at the client level but you need to uh, use uh, salt states for instance or budget scripts or just log into the client to use dnf directly or you could also apply content life cycle management filters, CLM filters, but um, and you can apply uh, dates, so um, filter patches by date or filter by synopsis or whatever. But the moment that you apply um, a content life cycle management that selects some upstream, then all the, the those upstreams will be flattened into a flat repository. What we cannot do yet 
is in if you are using assigning uh, upstreams so modular voices directly to the client the web ui will not show the status up um, may not show the the actual state of the system right yeah. because the, because the, what we are doing currently is we are not disabling the upstreams on the clients in order to be able to manage everything from the ui and to have the ui represent exactly the status of the of those modular systems we will need to manage the upstreams the same way we do repositories. We will need to disable those upstreams, mirror them, and then compute exactly all the combinations for each system or for each group of systems. So it's mm -hmm. it's a complex problem that essentially requires adding a solver to the Uni server, which is yeah, quite a lot of work. And we have not we have discussed that many times, but we have not really uh, started work implementing this or even researching this yet. But from from the many requests or the many commands that we get in that direction, I can see that this is becoming more and more important to users. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. And I see a question from Christian as well. The customer was asking whether it is possible to export the particular packages, RPM or DEB, a particular software channel frozen by content live cycle projects to a director on disk. I'm not the expert on this. I could think of a way of doing that querying the uh, API, of course. But well, we had Jung here. Do we uh, have any functionality? I can, I can answer that, uh, Julio, if you want. OK. Uh, so uh, the current implementation of InterServer Sync, at least in the past, should be able to work with the offline environment. Uh, but I'm not sure how is the state of that code and if that is even supported at the moment. But we are working on a new implementation of InterServer Sync, and the first implementation will work exactly in that way. So you will be able to export um, content of any channel to a folder, uh, copy that folder to the target servers, and then import it again. Okay. I will just drop the repository URL in the chat, and if you want to give it a try, we will be more than happy to have some feedback. And now that you tell that this is the thing, I seem to remember that we are, did we include that package on 2021-06 as optional? I, uh, I don't think we we have included it uh, yet in the this new version. Um, you can use another repository, but uh, for someone in the community to use, I think we can enable it. But you have an OBS, um project from my home dear where you can download it uh but you can check and then we can make it available yeah. that's correct it's not on the product definition so it was it's on the repository on a unimaster but not added to the images yet yeah hmm. and the current implementation i'm not sure if it is still working in the offline environment or not and with the uh, dev packages also But the new one should work with uh, all the packages and should be able to export offline. Good. Any other questions or comments? Maybe just a short question about Uni on, on ARM. I think in one of the last versions, uh, it was said that uh, it's now also available for uh, for um, ARM machines such as Raspberry Pi or other machines. Uh, any news on that? The it, images it are available, yes. And I know that there are some users using that even in production. Oh, really? Great. Yeah. Yeah. Was... So the Uni stable already has the the repositories for ARM but it is still not part of the documentation because we are waiting for the community to provide us feedback about how things are going if there is anything to be fixed but if you want to install a union top of OpenSUSE Leap 15.3 arm right now mm -hmm. then yes that works just remember that if you use it provide us feedback even if it is positive so we know that everything is going well yeah, 
great. I saw that uh, there are folders on the mirror side, but they are not linked in the documentation. So I have a Raspberry Pi here with eight gigabytes of memory. I think that would be a good way to test it. Yes, with eight gigabytes of memory, I think it should be enough for at least a small installation of Uni with a few few clients. Yeah. So great. typically, the, the way you will deploy this for a real production environment will be using some R64 servers or even easier because getting a hold of that kind of hardware is not that easy on public clouds. You have Definitely. Oracle yeah. and AWS and all that. So the R64 instances there are cheaper than Intel instances and they are very performant. Yeah, so Oracle Cloud has this offer currently for, uh, f um, f I think, three VMs for, for free. So maybe I will also try this. Cool. Let's see how, how faster repositioning gets there with all the parallelization. I guess that is that question a question for Victor? Because I see he was writing at the chat. No, it's not a question. It's just about the running on uh, Raspberry Pi 5, it runs fine, but uh, for the large repos, it could fail on on killer for Java. If the repo is very large, and could eat all the memory, and it's better to add swap in this case. And repo sync is, is a bit slower than in x yeah, and of course, if we want something somehow fast, I would recommend you avoid using SD cards for this. Yes, use an external USB 3 disk, if possible, SSD, and should give you an acceptable performance at least. Good, more questions? Okay, then, John, I will stop presenting. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me well. Um, hi, everyone. My name is John. Um, I'm one of the Uni developers and also in the SUSE manager team. Uh, let me quickly share my screen. Um, I don't want to take too much of your time and leave some time for questions, so I will straightly go to the demo and show you everything um, in real time. So today I'm going to talk uh, about the new usability feature that we have that is called um, filter templates in content lifecycle management. So in general, a filter template is um, a usability enhancements that um, where you can um, where you can do the most common stuff that you do while adding filters to to um, co to a content lifecycle project. Um, this could be, um, okay, for now, uh, we have two types of filters, uh, and then and they are both targeted for uh, for creating a life patching projects. So um, let me go ahead and show you how do we do that. So first I will start off with how um, you can set up a live patching project manually, like how you could do it um, before um, template filters, uh, filter templates. So I would go ahead and create a new project called live patching menu. So uh, what I do is, what I would do is I would go ahead and add my product. Of course, this um, live patching um, only applies to SUSE product. Uh, and it's only relevant if you're using some live patching supported SUSE product. So I went ahead and added my all um, SLIS 15 SP1 channels. And the next, th next thing I would do is create some filters. And this is the most complicated process of creating a live patching product because when setting up a live patching environment, you always start with a with a specific kernel version in your mind. So it might it, it could be the latest um, running kernels in your clients, or you might um, have a requirement to use a specific kernel. So you, first off, you should note this kernel version. 
And the next thing you need to do is um, to remove all the regular, all the real kernel updates that are greater than this version, so they don't interfere with your updates. And then you would replace them um, with the equivalent live patching packages. So here we are going to do it um, using some filters. So Jan, maybe we need to make a little introduction to how live patching works, because so okay. like there's there's the normal kernel packages, and then there's the the live kernel packages. Those live kernel packages accept um, reboot, accept new versions that will not require reboot that install trampolines in the code. So with a normal kernel, you cannot use the live kernel patches right so that's that's why this is this gets super complex and this is why this feature is so great okay i'll go ahead now and yeah so i basically i need to remove the regular kernel packages after the point that i start live patching and instead i want my repository to include these live patching ver versions of these packages so i'm um, going to use um, the filter named patch contains package. So I want to essentially remove all the patches that um, includes the kernel package, which is greater than um, the kernel I'm going to live patch. So here are all the values. And for the version, I have my required kernel version that I want to live patch on mine. For example, I'm going to put in these values. I think this is currently the latest anyway. Um, so these are the values I would use for, for to set up this project manually. So as you can already see, this is a complicated project um, process. So you need to think about the strategy. So this is a working strategy. But of course, there might be alternative ways to do this with a bunch of different filters. So this filter, when I create it, by itself, effectively uh, remove the regular kernel packages starting from the version uh, later than the version that I specified. So when you assign your clients to this these channels, you will never be offered a regular kernel update anymore. But since the live patching packages will be inside the repository, um, whenever a new live patch is released, you will get those as the as updates, and therefore you won't have to reboot your system after a kernel update. So optionally, at this point, you might want to um, ensure that this channel never offers a reboot to your systems. Um, but of course, there might be some other patches that might require reboot, like unrelated to a kernel. So if you if you really want to make sure that you never want, want to reboot this um, these systems again, um, we also have another type of filter um, that is patch keyword. Uh, the matcher is contains, and there's you can see all uh, some keywords here that are, that are included in the patches. So if you choose this one, um, and let me name it. So when I add this as well, it will also make sure to remove all the patches that would require a reboot, whether they're related to kernels or for any reason. Then, of course, you might want to add some other filters, maybe uh, make some exceptions to these filters, like, OK, I want no reboot package, but only this specific thing I want. Then you can add some allow filters that overrides this stuff, um, whatever whatever you want. And yeah, the, the rest of the, this rest of the process is usual. I would add some environment, I will build this, and I will have my channels ready. But I'm not going to do that part, because there's nothing special about it. So this is how would you do it manually. And now here comes the part um, of filter templates. So I'm going to create the same project again, but this time I'm going to use some filter template. Um, let me go back here. Let me name this one. Okay, so the scenario here is, um, let's say, I just want to set up live patching with you uh, considering the kernel, uh, current kernel version that all my clients have installed. So I will start, my, my objective here is I don't want to update 
kernel in a, in a traditional way anymore. So I just want to start live patching at this point in time. And let's say, okay, so the sources are the same. But well, actually, I don't have my live patching channels here synced, but usually you want, of course, you want to have your live patching channels here as well so that the live patch packages are included. Uh, anyway, so, okay. Um, let's go ahead with the filters. I create new filter. So as you might have seen, there's a new uh, button here that says use a template. This is the new part. So I'm gonna click this and it turns the, it changes the form. To a different thing. So now you can see here a bunch of templates. So we have two templates uh, implemented. Um, by the way, I actually talked about the first filter uh, that is live patching based on a SUSE product. And, and th this is already re released with 2021.05 version. But the second one that I'm going to show um, after this is the new one and hasn't been released yet. Um, so um, yeah, let's start with the system one actually. So this is more suitable if you want um, to start live patching with the actual installed kernel versions on your client. So in this way, um, the form asks you to select a system that is select any SUSE system registered in your SUSE manager. Currently, I have only one attached to it, but this might be thousands of systems. And if the, if it's if this list goes on, um, it displays to you only twenty systems here. But if you have a lot of systems and you need the specific one, you can just start typing and then it, the, um, the input will be filtered on whatever system you need. Um, so when I select the system, now it displays me all the list of kernels, but I think, one second, I have some problem with my connection. Okay, let's start over. Okay, specific system. I select my system. Now it displays me all the installed kernel versions in this system automatically. So this is, like I say, useful if you have already, if you want to keep your already installed kernel version and start live patching from that. So this is the already selected one is the currently installed and currently running kernel version of this client. And when I go ahead and save this as is, it's basically what it does is it creates me two different filters here. So these filters after created, they're just regular filters that like you're used to. But what, what a filter template does is it helps create this bunch of filters automatically. So if, if you compare this, for example, let me click edit. And if you clear, compare this filter to the first project I created, this is identical. And of course it added also the second filter to uh, deny all the reboot required um, patches, but if you if you think this this is not what you wanted, you might just as well go ahead and delete this. Um, actually, first detach it, and then you might delete it. So um, the good thing about this is after this filter template creates your filters, you can still play around with the filters. You can modify them, add or remove something and make it suit your needs. So this was the second um, method of achieving the same objective. And finally, let me quickly create another one. So I'll name it live patching product. And I'm going to use the other filter now. Um, again, use the template, but this time I'm going to select live patching based on a SUSE product. So this different than the other one is it asks you is a product instead of a, instead of a client. This this scenario um, this scenario is more suitable if you if you if you have a certain required kernel version that you need to use throughout your, your channels and in that case um, this list offers you all the synced SUSE products that are, that support live patching i have only 15 sp1 synced in my in my in my system so if you have more all will be listed here so when i click to this one then it displays 
all the kernel versions that are served inside this product. So starting from the first one up to the latest one. So again, with the same as before, I will select this kernel version. And I, when I click Save, again, you will see all the same filters created. So the diff difference between this um, template and the other one is um, one starts from a client and it's installed kernel version and the other one um, lets you pick any kernel version inside of the product. Um, that's basically what we introduced with filter templates. Um, this um, the, the best thing it does is it, it simplifies and autom autom automatizes the most critical part of this, which is picking the correct filter, picking the looking up the correct kernel version, etc. Um, filter templates is a is more general concept that other than live patching, of course. But currently, like I said, we have only two types of templates that support live patching. But in the future, as we see the need, as we see that um, the users you make the common steps and create a bunch of filters serving a special purpose, we, we, we will plan to add more and more templates into this. For example, um, there, another common scenario that people struggle with is the app stream filters. So it's a very common use case that the users uh, would like to add every module with their default streams. So there are almost 50 modules right now in, in, in a CentOS 8 app stream repository, for example. And then if you want all of them included, you have to do the same steps over and over again for 50 times to include all the all the modules into in, into the project project. But with this with a simple filter template, you might want you can say, um, okay, I want all the modules enabled with all their default values. And then when you save the filter template, it will create you 50 um, module filters here with all the default values. And then even if you want some of those uh, modules other than the default stream, then you can go ahead and edit those filters and pick any stream you want. Um, yeah, this is one of the things we planned already. Um, and of course, with any other ideas are from you also welcome. Um, whenever we see the need um, to, to that we can automate do automatization of any kind of process here, we will keep adding more filter templates. Um, yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say. Now, I think we can have some time for questions. So what, one comment from my side is, uh, if you have ever tried to use live patching, you know how difficult it is to set up this. So this is the first time Jan showed to me, I called them by Loth because I had just a few days earlier, I had had to, to configure this manually myself. With, it's a pain in the ass, essentially. And and then uh, the other thing is, of course, we from SUSE are going to implement this only for SUSE operating systems, but that's not to say if, if, if the community once this for RHEL, CentOS, um, Alma, Ubuntu, whatever, you can, of course, contribute the code to do this. The mechanism is, I think, generic enough that will be possible to implement this, or Amazon Linux, for instance, with those three-month live kernels. Yeah, like I said, okay, so live patching is only applicable in the contents of um, SUSE products, but the next one, for example, the AppStream um, filter templates would be even more useful for, for uni users, I would say. Okay, if there's no more questions, I think I'm done. So thank you for your attention and see you next month. We have a comment in the chat actually. Ah. Yeah. A minimum of a month. Yeah. Kind of like patching with the reboot process schedule for patching. Yeah. What to do with the old patches essentially? It's nothing in the question with the old filters.
Uh, wait, I didn't get it exactly. Yeah, so one, if you are going to set up monthly um, reboot cycles, then you will end up with um, once per month or 12 filters like this per right. year that right. are no longer used, right? What to do with them, I think? Um, when you change the filters and pick a newer version, um, that should just work fine. You can delete the filters and add the new fil add some new filters with the new updated version. That would work. Or since the filters are already there, you can just edit them and manually type the new version yourself, which I would suggest. I would say they would both work, work fine. I mean, as long as the new version you set is later than the first one, uh, after the build, everything should be synced. So that would that change would automatically include the regular kernel packages in between. So then after you build this, you can update all your systems with the regular kernel update. And then from that point, it would start live patching again. Okay, I guess that was it. So back to you, Paul. Stefan, yeah, of course I have minutes for you, and even more than one minute. <laughs> so in case you're not familiar, Stefan is the guy who started the port and even completed to a certain degree the port of Uni to CentOS. Thank you for the brief introduction, Paul. <laughs> um, yeah, I just uh, if if nobody else got any more questions, actually, I want to pick up on that topic, if that's okay. Of course. So um, yeah, as you mentioned before, actually, um, overall, I did complete the port. Um, so I had it working on centers. It was working back fine in February. Um, I mean, there's always things are a moving target, and I kind of want to. I didn't manage to put all of the changes that I did, especially required packages back into the OBS. And I slowly want to start picking up on that one again because I want to pretty much set up my production server for that one. Um, it's a question on how you can best support me on doing that one because I don't want to do the changes again and then they are uh, pretty much still in a, in a moving target and uh, packages are getting outdated. And I was wondering how to best actually do this one. What do you mean about the moving target? The fact that we change it from leap 15.2 to dot to 15.3 or what exactly? Um, well, the moving targets being uh, no, not just necessarily on your side, but also, for example, on um, back then center side, uh, m moving up the patches, the version numbers, so all my dependencies are breaking. And uh, also when, for example, the packages are being, well, the, the dependencies of the packages, the builds of the packages. So pr pretty much I have to not start from scratch um, on that one, but because you are not maintaining it centrally, um, my links all break. So I want to obviously start moving. I've created, for example, I've created a couple of Java packages um, that are still in my OBS repository that I want to move over to uh, ideally the um, Uyuni others repository. But also I think a couple of more packages that I would like to have changed or updated. Um, or pretty much new packages. So I need some packaging guidelines on how to best submit it to, to others. And I need some guidance on what to do with the Java packages or how to best handle them. Yeah, for if they are dependencies that uh, should go to other, then I suggest you first give us the list of dependencies because if there are not that many, then maybe we can, you can submit them directly to other. But if there are too many, then I think we better create a sub project for the yeah, center like or or other sent or something exactly like that. exactly yes that is for the dependencies uh for the other packages well whatever lives on the github repository uni project slash uni then it's just a matter of submitting there the changes we can help you with that then it could be that there are some other um packages where you will need to request help from someone else inside the thing as well but i'm thinking i don't know cobbler the subscription matcher uh, of one of them. <laughs> yeah exactly i don't think let me check the list of guests but 
I don't think we have someone from the Iron Squad today, or maybe yes. So I think so. All the Git changes are done. All the code changes mm -hmm. I had to do, they're all pushed into the Git. So I'm pretty happy with that one. So these are actually I'm, all dependencies. I'm from the Iron. Yeah, we have Victor here. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, Victor. right. Yeah, I'm also around here. Okay. Um, so uh, there, there's a couple of them, for example, in the master branch. Cobbler is one of them. I had a small fight with different people there trying to um, to put Cobbler into or actually update it for a line of change. So I was kind of stuck in lots of discussions there. If Cobbler, I can tell you something about that one, for example. That one <laughs> is slightly uh, different than the other packages because we have a Debel project where Cobbler lives at, our, yeah. at OBS, which is, is, if I'm not correct, we have now Eno, right, Pablo? Who can help with this? Yes. Because the changes to the spec should go there first, and then when they are accepted there, uh, someone from the Iron Squad, Pablo, Eno, or even, even yourself, can prepare a submit request to Unimaster. Mm. Yeah, that's actually, uh, I tried, that's where I, I had my main fight, really, um, trying to get my one line of change introduced there in the um, SUSE Coppola package, in the dev package. Okay. Um, uh, <laughs> send me a mail with the details because the good thing is we are hiring the main uh, Cobbler developer. <laughs> so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now we have some leverage there. Okay. I mean, ideally, everything would be fine if we uh, go to Cobbler 4, but I guess that you have some dependencies there, right? Because yeah. I checked with uh, the it will require Cobbler some 4. some testing, some extensive testing uh, on the suicide. side. And yeah. So, <laughs> if okay. Um, yeah, I draft that one, and the other ones are really. Um, I, I've got my repository um, uh, for like the other packages, which I'm not sure, probably 50 or so. so I don't remember out of the top of my head. I have to redo all of them. But do um, you still depend on on power tools and all of that? That you? Uh, I've removed with? a lot, actually. That's the thing. Okay. I have removed a lot, and uh, some other packages I I pulled in into my repository just to to get these kind of dependencies mm -hmm. out. I mean, if they are build dependencies, it's yeah, fine yeah. to to depend on power tools and all of that. But if they are runtime dependencies, I think it's better to not depend on that because of or EPL yeah. especially because of, of all the mess that that will for sure cause. Um, In that case, it's uh, it's better to just copy the package, yeah, and update from time to time, and that's it. Do you have any guidelines on how to create new packages? Like well, in OBS or for uni in specifically? Uh, both, pretty much. I mean, I can create an OBS package. Uh, I'm not sure if it matches up to any standards. It matches up to my own standards, which are probably pretty good. <laughs> so. Yeah, for, for <laughs> OBS packages and in general, even for those that come from uni uh, project slash uni, what we use is the guidelines from OpenSUSE. OK. Um, then I'll give that one a try. Can you send me a link to those? If you have my hand, thank you very much. Um, I guess you're a Gitter, right? Can I send I'm on the Gitter link? Now, yeah, just, uh, yeah but now Alex it. already did. So yeah. Alex is okay. faster than any of us. <laughs> okay, I'll follow these and then try to submit some more packages. Um, so what I did, I'd send out a list of all packages. I think I did at some point. I sent out a list of all packages that I want to have um, from my side. Uh, in there, the obvious ones, I would uh, follow the packaging guidelines and on all the Java packages, I think we have to think of something there. Because yeah, there are a lot of Java the ones. For submitting, I, I would suggest that you create you quickly create a table with all, depend, all the dependencies. Mm -hmm. If they are build time or runtime dependencies, and yeah. then with that, we can decide where to place them, et cetera, et cetera. OK, I, I'll do that one then. Yep. Thanks. Yeah, I just want to do this activity one more time, really, and then have it closed off. <laughs> yeah, no problem. If, if you are not at Gitter, then we can follow up the discussion at the Devil mailing list. Or if you want something quicker, then we are available at the Devil channel at Gitter as well. Yeah, yeah but I've got that one as well. Cool. Do that one. Thank you very much. And of course, if other people want to help Stefan, yeah, I think he will be more than happy to accept help. Yeah. Mainly creating packages now, or just rechecking all of that one. See me draw for. 
Sorry, what was that? I think that was someone who was unmuted. Or uh, count on me on some language that we don't understand. <laughs> I, I think it was in Spanish and it was Sebastian, but not sure if he wanted to ask something or he was just No, unmuted. no, sorry. I was, I was, uh, the, uh, my mic that was unmuted. Sorry so much. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Okay. We still have a few minutes. So if you have anything you want to ask or comment, feel free to do it. Also, a wish list next week, actually, we will be working on what's coming in the next year for unions as a manager. So ideas from the community are very welcome, as usual. You know that we adopted Ansible for for the for this release of Susan Major and, and Uni because it was an idea that came also with a, a nice, a very nice and doable proposal from the community. So keep all those great ideas coming. Yeah, and, I, and of course I'm looking forward to try Uni on top of well, maybe not CentOS 8, but Alma Linux 8. <laughs> um, let me answer one more. Um, suggestion in the chat. Um, well, the suggestion is to update the uh, about these live patching filters. It's the suggestion is to update the um, the version we picked for the kernel every determined period, let's say six months. Um, I guess that, that this might be already possible with some smart um, scripting, for example. So um, all the all the actions we do in content lifecycle management are also available via the API. So some timely script could just edit those filters and um, enter a new new kernel version and then build the build the project again. So that is achievable like that as I see it. Yes, yeah, so the idea, the request is actually to automate this. Something to consider. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we currently have no structure for that kind of thing in the contents, context of content lifecycle management. But like I said, the simplest way I see it possible is via scripting. One question: There is any way to to create a salt state to uh, to apply in any server all the patches that are not needed to be rebooted, all the live patches available for it, obviously. Uh, yeah, I mean, you could do that. You don't even need to create salt states for that. You could just um, create content lifecycle management filters that will where you are uh, rem or uh, denying all the packages which require reboot with this uh, reboot required keyword. And then you can configure on the systems, the option, I can't remember the exact name, is auto install updates or something like that. So when the, the software channels that come out of the content lifecycle management will be software packages that will not require any reboot. And then when you set this auto install uh, available updates or something like relevant updates, it's something like that is the wording. Uh, then it will just happen. If you probably want to add a maintenance window on top of that so that it, the server doesn't reboot in the middle of the day. You probably want to add a maintenance window that reboots only at night or weekends or something like that, but it works already. Um, yeah, it's to, to understand how difficult is, is that uh, when they are asked or when, when someone is asking about uh, avoid mistakes. I mean, no, it, it's just a matter of a few clicks, actually. So it's a normal container cycle management project where you set a filter, which is deny reboot required. You will obtain software channels. You assign those software channels to the systems. And then on those systems, you have a checkbox in the system properties. And then you say uh, automatically install relevant software updates, something like that. It's the name. You will see it right. I think it's the one that's the line that's 
uh, before the, uh, the, the add-ons, the monitoring add-on, uh, Ansible, control node, and all of that. And that's okay, it. Thank and you. it will just happen. You don't even need to write any salt or configuration or anything. Any more questions, comments, suggestions, feature requests? If not, guys, I think we can close for today. And see you at the next community hours. See you in one month and thanks everyone for attending. Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. See you. Thanks everyone. Bye. Nice weekend. Bye. Thanks. Bye.